So hello uh, to everybody. Welcome to this episode of the of our webinar series facing an outbreak uh, issues of global health ethics and technology. Today uh, we have uh, some guests and speakers uh, uh, which are very uh, very. I think they are working on very relevant issues uh, during uh, for this um, for this uh, moment, uh, like to say, for this special situation we are dealing with, uh, and I mean the pandemics. Uh, they are special guests because uh, we have worked with many of them, with some of them. We met someone for the first time, but uh, there is a long. Uh, dialogue among the institutions also that which are involved today. So I, I thank uh, all of you for coming and joining us. Um, Talita Koreman Gittin is uh, a colleague of the a researcher at the Université de louvain la Nove in Belgium. She is working on theological ethics and more particularly on the uh, on the issues of disability and intellectual disability and theological studies on the intellectual disabilities. She has, she has this uh, very peculiar focus and um, her main work and book uh, is uh, the, her latest book is on theologies of disabilities and the teaching of the Catholic Church. So I thank uh, Talita for joining us and to, for bringing us uh, your competence and experience in this, uh, in this field of research you are working in. Jerome Bitosam is a colleague uh, who worked uh, with, uh, uh, with us uh, because he was a visiting researcher past year at the the Department of Humanities of the University of Trento. Jerome is um, is associate professor of the University of Bamenda in Cameroon, and he is professor of philosophy and bioethics at the philosophy department there. Uh, Jerome um, has a focus, a research focus on cultural perspectives in bioethics. Uh, uh, but he works uh, uh, more extensively as written on philosophy of medicine, on global health inequalities, on vulnerability and solidarity, and on global bioethics. Um, Carlo Brentari, who will be our discussant today, is a colleague, is a researcher of the Department of Humanities at the University of Trento. Uh, Carlo earned a PhD in philosophy at the Graz University in Austria and uh, he has extensively worked and written on German philosophical anthropology, on the ontology of nature, on theory, enviro environmental theories and on environmental ethics. Um, Carlo works uh, um, right now also on animal ethics uh, and he has uh, uh, his competence on anthropological competence is uh, uh, is very relevant so he will help us to discuss some of the issues we we will uh, uh, present today um, i am happy you could uh, join us some other colleagues will arrive later and uh, um, I wish to say that uh, so this webinar series has been organized in partnership with the Department of Humanities of the University of Trento, so the Department of Carlo. Uh, Michele Nicoletti is the co-organizing co this series. And I can say now that uh, I think the idea, the original idea of the series uh, is something we had past year when Jerome uh, was uh, working in Trento with us. So we started thinking why we don't uh, reason, we don't try to reflect on the present uh, outbreak, uh, considering not only uh, the local perspective we were dealing with, uh, but also a more global perspective. And so that's uh, 
one of the reasons because we organized and uh, co-organized this, uh, this series. So I thank all of you for joining us. I think uh, uh, this episode is dedicated to very relevant issues, which are fragility and fragile patients, uh, vulnerability and spirituality in healthcare. So I thank all of you for coming and I leave the floor to Talita Koreman, who will be our first speaker. Thank you, Lucia, for your invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, let me just share my screen with all of you. Hope this works okay. We've done some trials, so okay. Okay, can you, can you yes. see my yes, screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, um, let me start my introduction with a short story. The old lady, let's call her Betty, sits at a table in the middle of the dementia ward and sings Kyrie Eleison for hours at an end with her eyes closed. I ask the ward nurse if I can have a conversation with Betty, but I am told she has an MMS score of 11, so she's in an advanced stage of dementia, not capable of much conversation anymore. I asked the nurse if I can try and she shrugs. Do as you please, she says. Betty is still singing. I ask her if I can sit down and she nods. Then I ask if she wants to pray with me. Oh yes. I begin a Hail Mary, which she recites with me. Do you want to pray the Lord's Prayer? She nods and opens her hands, and together we pray our Father. After which she continues, Credo in unum Deum, and she looks at me expectantly. Now, I was born after Vatican II, and Latin does not come easily to me without the reassuring presence of a community. Nevertheless, I sing with her, Patrem omnipotentem, pactorem sceli et terra. And then already I hesitate. It is more complicated in Latin, isn't it? Betty says mischievously, and she chuckles. And there she goes again with her Kyrie incantations. Now, some medical doctors would attribute what happened between Betty and me to procedural memory alone with no deeper meaning. I can't believe this, and I am not alone. I have several colleagues who also believe that there is more, and you may see some of them on your screen. I experienced a beautiful, deeply religious and spiritual moment of sharing prayer with Betty, and I have the audacity to believe that for her, the joy was shared. As John Swinton wrote, Betty's procedural memory functions as a real pathway that puts her in the presence of Jesus Christ. All those years of prayer, all those hours spent at Mass, all those readings of the Gospel bear fruit when Betty celebrates in her body the memory of God. And so what if she does not remember our prayer five minutes later? In God's time, isn't there only presence? Now, in my short presentation, I will define how I understand spirituality and spiritual care, how this can be experienced in the dementia ward through spiritual reminiscence, and how spiritual care was affected by the COVID pandemic. And here we go straight away, point number one. Now, it goes without saying, but it is always better to say it. To be human entails being constituted of biological, psychological, social, and spiritual dimensions. Needless to say that the most controversial of these four is the latter one. 
but I don't want to get into any controversies about what spirituality is. So let me start this uh, presentation with what is referred to as Kristina Puchalski's consensus definition. You probably know it. It goes like this. Spirituality is a dynamic and intrinsic aspect of humanity through which persons seek ultimate meaning and transcendence and experience relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or the sacred. Spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. Though I believe this definition very interesting to work with, I find it too focused on cognition because it is intrinsically linked to meaning seeking. And persons with cognitive challenges in advanced stages of dementia, for example, or persons with profound intellectual disabilities might not always be able to reflect cognitively on the meaning of life. This does not imply, however, that they are void of spirituality or that their life has no meaning. That is why I like to combine Puchalski's consensus definition with the definition of my colleague, Professor Dominique Jacquemin in Louvain la Neuve, which is less centered on cognition. Dominique says, spirituality is the movement of existence of the human subject, and it is made up of three or four dimensions that are intrinsically linked and in constant interaction. The bodily, the psychic, the ethical or social, and the religious or transcendent dimension for some. For Dominique Jacquemin, each of these dimensions constitutes a possible entry to relate to a person's spirituality. So interacting with the body, taking care of a person's body, can have a deeply spiritual meaning, even when the persons engaged are not explicitly looking for an ultimate meaning. Having said this, I don't want to be too quick to dismiss the search for meaning with people who experience dementia on the pretext that they can no longer think on an abstract level. Recent research shows quite the opposite. In her uh, research work, uh, Losing Memory, Losing Meaning, Dr. Laura de Witte from KU Leuven in Belgium um, clearly shows that there is no correlation between the perceived sense of meaning and cognitive abilities of elderly persons with dementia. De Witte shows that persons with a low MMS score can still indicate um, that they feel their life has meaning. De Witte states that we usually overestimate the importance of cognitive abilities in how people evaluate their lives. So how can we explain that meaning is preserved when cognitive skills decline? One explanation is that it is more about a felt sense of meaning. Experiencing meaning in life is less of a cognitive process and more of a felt, a lived experience. A physically, corporeally felt meaning is more implicit and more holistic. It is a sense of meaning resulting from a dynamic synthesis of emotional and cognitive processes, but which does not require that all cognitive functions are fully intact. For me, and those are not uh, Laura de Witte's words, for me, this bodily felt sense of meaning coincides with Dominique Jacquemin's intuition that the body is a possible gateway to spirituality. And I also want to emphasize that spirituality is not necessarily religious. And it is not the prerogative of priests, chaplains, or faith communities to care for someone's spiritual well being. Though in long term care and in nursing homes, of course, these are still the persons that are in charge, usually, of organizing spiritual care. And uh, Jerome, I leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Lucia, for inviting me to um, present on this topic, very interesting and important topic during this time of uh, the COVID, uh, caring for fragility and vulnerability 
in the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, I must begin by saying that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, is a pandemic not like others that the world has seen. Um, what the, we have observed is that the COVID-19 has actually shown us how equally, how interconnected the world is and how equally vulnerable we all as human beings are across the world. It has shown very clearly, more than ever, how uh, our lives can really depend on each other and uh, how in times of pan pandemic, uh, we can become so interdependent with one another. It has also uh, increased or exacerbated the situation of those who were previously considered as vulnerable people. Um, the ethics, it has also, the COVID-19, um, raised or brought to light the importance and the relevance of the ethics of care and the obligations that we have towards dependent members of our community. So uh, in this presentation, I am going to look at the, I'm going to look at the concept of vulnerability. The, I'm going to look at COVID-19 or vulnerability during the, the, the period of COVID-19. And this is going to lead me to talk about vulnerability and dependency, as well as obligations towards justice. Because the notion, the idea of vulnerability calls for obligations to assist others, those who are dependent on us. So fragility, uh, the next issue I'm going to talk about will be vulnerability, interdependency, and the ethics of care. And finally, I am going to uh, argue that, in my opinion, solidarity, whether in the micro level, when I talk about the micro level, I'm talking about uh, the ethics of care within the hospital setting, and at the macro level, here I'm talking about at the global level, at the international level. So solidarity will be a very important uh, way forward in this very cr crucial uh, pandemic or crucial critical era uh, um, uh, of health crisis. So um, what is fragility and vulnerability? When we say um, somebody is fragile, we simply mean that the person is susceptible or susceptible to harm uh, or something that is easily broken or is liable to break, something which is delicate. There is a very close link between fragility and vulnerability here. Um, I'll come back to that. So liability, uh, uh, when we say somebody is vulnerable, we simply mean the person is, is also liable to harm, to exploitation, to deception, uh, to be wronged or treated un unfairly. So um, Derek Selman, one of the uh, theoricians of uh, the notion of uh, vulnerability, describes vulnerability, uh, a vulnerable a vulnerable person as somebody who is susceptible to harm as a result of either a higher than normal exposure to risk or a reduced, sometimes absent capacity to protect themselves. Now, um, what we have to understand here is that as human beings, in our very nature as human beings, we are all vulnerable beings. We're vulnerable to uh, grieve, to the loss of um, family members who are vulnerable to different kinds of situations in life, accidents, natural disasters, and so on and so forth. So all human beings are vulnerable. But do we actually, in this context, categorize every human being in the context of COVID-19 as vulnerable? I will come back to, to it. So as embodied beings, we have bodily and uh, material needs. As, that's ontological from a ontological perspective. We are exposed to illness, to injury, to death, and depend on the care of others. Okay, so 
uh, according to, I've come back to Selman, according to Selman, all human beings are vulnerable. But some human beings are more than ordinarily vulnerable. So we admit the fact that we are by our very nature ontologically vulnerable. But those whom we classify as, uh, we usually classify as vulnerable, are those who have a, a certain higher degree of vulnerability that makes them uh, dependent on others or that deprives them of their capacity to protect or protect themselves against harm. Okay? We are all vulnerable, but those who are able to protect themselves from harm are less vulnerable than those who are so fragile and so delicate to the extent that they are unable to protect themselves. Here I'm thinking of of uh, people who are seriously sick. I'm thinking of embryos. We're thinking of uh, neonates, newborn babies who are uh, unable to, de to defend themselves, to protect themselves, who do not have a certain capacity of autonomy. So our vulnerability is not simply a function of the extent of our exposure to human, to, to harm, but it is also the function of our, our ability for self-protection. This is very important. We are also socially vulnerable. As social and affective beings, we're emotionally and psychologically vulnerable to others in different ways. For example, to loss and grief, to neglect and abuse, uh, to the lack of care, to rejection, to social ostracism, and to humiliation. Again, we can be sociopolitically vulnerable. And here, I mean, we can be vulnerable, the people, the common people, can be vulnerable to exploitation, to manipulation, to oppression, to violence and abuse of their rights by politicians and by those who hold, who wield power in society. And finally, we can be vulnerable to nature. Okay, here I'm referring to disasters, droughts, technologically induced actions that can provoke some natural disasters and so on and so forth. Um, to begin with, it is important for me to state that the, in, in, in the, the domain of bioethics, when we talk about vulnerab vulnerability has largely been discussed uh, in, in the domain of health research ethics. Right, health research ethics. Here we are talking about uh, the, the vulnerability of research subjects in uh, clinical trials and so on and so forth in, 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 in developing parts of the world where a huge chunk of uh, clinical trials are taking place. There, are, there have been stories, publications about the exploitation of vulnerable persons, prisoners, pregnant women, people who are not educated ed educated enough to be able to understand and defend their rights and so on and so forth. So, but also there has been the neglect of the notion of vulnerability in modern, and, uh, in modern moral and political theory. And this uh, stems from the erroneous belief that our rationality as thinking beings is somehow independent of our, our animality. Here I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Alex, Alex Day McIntyre, um, his critique of, uh, of more, modern uh, moral theory and its rejection of, uh, or its neglect of the notion of vulnerability. So some emphasis has been placed on the capacity for rationality. Uh, neglecting the fact that we can also be, we are also animals, human animals, who can be exposed to some degree of harm. So fragility and, and vulnerability are intimately linked to relationality and dependency. Okay, um, the, the, the first thing is that both fragility and vulnerability um, are central to our personhood, okay? So, we the two concepts are connected because of their common, the idea of the common, of our common susceptibility.
ability to harm, to exploitation, and the need or the, the desire or the need for, 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 for dependency and for support and protection of those who have the capacity and ability to protect us. So, because during situations of fragility and vulnerability, we, we, we live in a kind of a stage, a situation of diminished authority. In fact, some authors like uh, Selman argue uh, uh, that the capacity for us to, de to depend and to be protected by others is what makes our society even meaningful. All right? So another connection between the two concepts that we it restricts, there is uh, restrict an individual's capacity to flourish. When you are fragile, when you are vulnerable, we have a restricted capacity to flourish, to have a truly meaningful and fulfilled life because we are unable to, to define the true meaning of life for ourselves. So, but however, all fragile persons are vulnerable, but not all vulnerable persons are fragile because uh, not all persons are more than ordinarily vulnerable. This is, this is important. I, I'm, uh, this idea is borrowed from uh, Selman because uh, it, it comes from the idea that we are by our very nature vulnerable at all times. But there is a threshold that distinguishes us from those who need help and those who do not need help. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a very uh, changing nature, a changing uh, nature of vulnerability. Uh, for example, some people who were considered vulnerable at the start of, of, of the pandemic, uh, the people who are considered vulnerable at the start of a pandemic can become, uh, who are not vulnerable, excuse me, from the start of the pandemic can become vulnerable uh, because of the policy response. Maybe the government may adopt an approach which rather exposes others instead of supporting them. So, but generally, during the COVID-19, we can uh, talk about a certain category of people who have become vulnerable. Here, we talk of health workers because of the manner in which the uh, the contagion spreads the health workers are those who are most exposed to uh, the pandemic to the spread of the pandemic because they have they are the ones who are in contact with the patients on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis second category of people are old people and here it is important for me to underline that not every all, all, not all old people are vulnerable because here i'm talking about all people who have underlying health challenges we know that old age comes with some kind of uh, reduced immune uh, weak, uh, weakening of the immune system and things like that so it is uh, highly possible that people of a certain age maybe 60 65 uh, usually already have some kind of health problems that uh, makes it very easy uh, sorry make it very easy for them to to uh, contract the virus it could be diabetes it could be cancer it could be heart disease and so on and so forth there are all other people generally whether young or old at whatever age people with underlying health problems or those with compromised immune systems. We also have socioeconomically disadvantaged people who are, uh, because they cannot effectively afford the facilities that permit them to respect, uh, to protect themselves, and the fact that they are really unable to respect social distancing measures because they have to go out every day to fend for themselves, and so on, they easily expose themselves to uh, uh, contracting the COVID uh, virus. We also talk of racially and et ethnic minor racial and ethnic minorities as well as homeless people. So these people are quite exposed. Uh, minorities who easily um, face discrimination and so on and so forth. So. 
This leads me to the next uh, section of my presentation, which has to do with vulnerability, fragility, dependency, and obligation towards justice. The idea of uh, vulnerability calls for the quest or the idea to address uh, to address vulnerability. Like uh, Bolt argues, to address vulnerability is to address one of the most fundamental characteristics of providing and receiving care in health care. In fact, we have healthcare providers face uh, vulnerable patients every day. Yeah. The patients who are placed under their care for their protection, for their medical care, and so on. Um, vulnerability calls for obligation to protect by being our brother's keeper. So because we are embodied beings, we are socially embedded and relationally constituted. So this dependency generates obligation on other members of the community since we are, by nature, I say I still again, uh, vulnerable to others' actions and vice versa. At the, at the international level or the global level, we have responsibility not only towards our families, neighbors, and in immediate community, but also towards distant people. Um, it is important for me to uh, state here that in the past, it was thought that we do have obligations only to people who are in proximate relation with us, those in our community, those we know. But gradually, with globalization, we've there is beginning of the con uh, consciousness, awareness that uh, we, are, and then with the interdependent nature and the inter and, and the universal nature of vulnerability, as we have seen during this crisis, there is a need for us to be concerned about others. One, for, for us to be able to protect ourselves, we must protect others. If we don't protect others, we are inviting the same situation on our doorsteps. Secondly, it is a humanly um, oriented kind of behavior for us to assist others, not only for self-interest by protecting our, ourselves, but for the sake of humanity that we should protect others. So the duty to protect vulnerable, the, the vulnerable falls on anyone who is in a position to assist here, but most uh, especially on those to whom uh, a person is most vulnerable or fragile to. Uh, these are politicians, these are people who take global decisions, the World Health Organization, and even institutions that are responsible maybe for the fabrication of drugs, vaccines that can be able to take care of the, 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 the situation of the very vulnerable. So, our principal duties and responsibilities arise from relationships of dependency and interdependencies, dependency that are not chosen. Some, we don't choose to be dependent on others. We don't choose for others to depend on us. So, uh, duties and responsibilities, according to Gordon, are not necessarily things that you deserve, we deserve. They are things that just happen. So, we have the responsibility to take uh, care of others, those who are fragile. That is, as I stated earlier, that what gives meaning to our humanity, to a true human society. A society that does not care about the most vulnerable is from an ethical and even political and social perspective, a society that is um, kind of uh, chaotic, so there is also power imbalance, which is important to mention here. So relationships involving inequalities of, of vulnerability create opportunities for, for more powerful persons to take unfair advantage of the more vulnerable persons, especially in situations where the more powerful exercise discretionary, discretional, uh, discretionary control over resources on which the more vulnerable uh, are dependent and cannot obtain elsewhere. Uh, recently, during the COVID-19, they have been during this particular era, they have been talking talks about vaccine hoarding by pharmaceutical in industries, pharmaceutical institutions, which 
uh, it's a very serious ethical issue. And it is also a time, a time of vulnerability is also a time where the business and profit monopolistic uh, dimension or monopolistic interest needs to be to be controlled seriously by governments and by institutions because what uh, with the capitalist or neoliberal approach where profit is the most important and not human lives there is the tendency that pharmaceutical companies can prefer, can pay more attention to the profit that they make and not to the human beings that are, are rescued as a result of their uh, uh, products. So, um, yeah, we if we look at it from a contractarian perspective, uh, the call uh, for obligation would, will uh, does not need does not actually require that we uh, we care about about uh, others. So they call the contractarian view. The call for obligations, not from the perspective of reciprocal relations of mutual advantage among equal citizens, as Rawls and other contractarians argue, but rather a theory of justice which must articulate principles that apply equally to citizens capable of fully cooperating and those unable to cooperate. You see, uh, from a Rawlsian contractarian uh, perspective, which uh, is an offshoot of the modern political and moral philosophical approach of the social contract. The social contract approach of roles in particular does not envisage that um, there may be other members of the society who do not have the capacity to engage in free, equal, and independent cooperation with other members of the society. And this is uh, one of Martin Nussbaum's critique of, uh, of, John, of John Rawls, okay? So the fact that the subjects of justice are free, equal, and independent, and prudentially and morally rational, effectively excludes persons with cognitive, and I may say, uh, physical impairments from citizenship, okay? Because for Rawls, Citizenship is a matter of negotiation between free and equal citizens. But not all citizens are equal because naturally some uh, are cognitively impaired, they're physically challenged and, and uh, they are sick, they are vulnerable, they are fragile. And by that, they do not have the same capacity of aut autonomy that permits them to engage with other, to engage in the so-called cooperation with other members of the society. So. We need care because we depend upon each other to help us meet our needs. So this dependency gives rise to an obligation to provide care for others. Um, the idea of it, this, the next uh, section of my presentation uh, handles the question of, uh, of vulnerability, uh, interdependence, and the ethics of care. And I would like to say here that um, apart from Aristotle, who, from whom we can trace the, the, the origin of uh, the notion of ethics of care, we can find there are feminist expressions of the ethics of care. We can find also that in indigenous African uh, moral theories, in Chinese and Orient, much of Oriental uh, theories, uh, where the emphasis is not laid on uh, rationality, self-determination as members of a community, but emphasis is laid on our relationality. And according to this, uh, what comes out of these traditions of um, care ethics is that we are by nature inter interconnected and interdependent beings, and that our autonomy is relational. It is not some abstract, uh, we are not some abstract entities that can actually truly survive and have a true meaning in our life without love, without loving and being loved by other members of the society. So we live for, as Newsman argues, we live for and with others 
and regard a life not lived in affiliation with others to be a life not worth living. Selman, on his uh, part, argues that our efforts to minimize our vulnerability are dependent upon the general goodwill of others. And you can imagine that a society without <laughs> goodwill, without the desire to support others, is, is not a society that one can actually dream of living in. So uh, this is because to be a person is to be a temporarily extended embodied subject whose identity is defined in and through uh, uh, one's lived bodily engagement with the world and others. So without collective caretaking, um, there could be no society. So it is caretaking labor that produces and reproduces society, according to Finman. So vulnerability, um, so a relational alternative provides, in my opinion, a more plausible approach to responding to fragile and vulnerable patients. So our care giving, the object of our care giving is to help the vulnerable regain their autonomy, as uh, uh, Dutz argues, providing an individual with the social, material, and emotional supports that either allow that person to flourish as far as is possible, to bring the life of a person with some recognized physical, cognitive, psychological disability into a position where their autonomy can can be realized. So caregiving as um, a part of healthcare is mainly to help those who have lost their capacity to protect themselves. I mean, what Selman calls more than ordinarily vulnerable to regain some degree or to regain completely their capacity for autonomous decision. In fact, to regain that capacity to be able to uh, take their lives into their own hands without depending on others. Now, <clears throat> um, there is a certain dimension we have seen during this crisis, I've, I've met, uh, hinted on that in, in, in a few minutes ago, which has to do with COVID-19, uh, capitalism, and global and vulnerability at the global level. We have seen that the COVID-19 has actually intensified global inequalities. Um, in, I'll just give an example in, the, in some parts of the global south. The, there's always already exist a kind of uh, economic and health divide between the, the global south and the global north. And in Africa in particular, that uh, shares a very huge burden of emerging and neglected diseases we, we find that the COVID-19 only comes in to intensify global health inequalities and from an economic standpoint, global economic inequalities. So, um, some who were not, for example, in the vulnerable category before the COVID-19 have become vulnerable. There are market incentives in, in capitalist economies and public health requirements, uh, which are contradictory. For example, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, market-rewarded self-interested behavior has been exposed as a source of morality, mortality and morbidity. I just give the example of uh, the hoarding of uh, vaccines uh, recently, which has caused a serious row and it has only it has only gone a long way to uh, increase or intensify global health inequalities and even economic inequalities in the world. So, the the we, what we see is that 
there is this preference for profit over humanity. The vaccines, uh, some rich countries uh, holding vaccines and blocking their wider production and distribution. Um, now, for my last part, what is the way forward? As a way forward, I argue for solidarity. And by solidarity here, I am referring to solidarity not only at the micro level, that is at, with, as, as far as bedside ethics is concerned, um, the protection of uh, care and support. This is where spirituality also comes in now. Care and support for those who are most vulnerable. So, like I said in my introductory uh, comments, the COVID-19 has actually demonstrated how interconnected and interdependent and of course, equally vulnerable we, we all are. Uh, like uh, Chatfield and Schroeder have argued, we need, if we want to have any global success in the fight against COVID-19, all nations and peoples to be included in the fight. And uh, solidarity seems to be in tune with the public health ethic, ethics approach because it seeks the common good and not individual, individual good. The relevance of solidarity lies particularly, according to Tim uh, Muellen, uh, lies particularly in its emphasis on relational aspects and the role of recognition in care practices, which are usually ignored in liberal approaches to justice. Now, let me just comment a little bit about the liberal approach to justice. This is a public health problem. And a, he a public health problem which uh, puts everybody in danger, the approach which requires that we pay attention to individual autonomy, to individual rights and so on, does not fit in this context. So the individualistic clinical ethics approach focuses more on individual rights, privacy and individual autonomy, and is not quite a plausible or appropriate way to confront a situation, a pandemic situation like the case of the COVID-19. So the pub public health approach is more suitable because it focuses on the common good and on communitarian values such as trust, neighborliness, reciprocity, and solidarity. But now, let me come back. What is solidarity? By uh, Solidarity requires actions to address vulnerabilities. It involves imaginatively putting ourselves in, this, in the shoes of others by being responsive to their plight. It requires collective commitment to carry cost to assist others. It entails actions across social and or geographical distance and asymmetric, asymmetry to assist other people who are vulnerable and to advance the cause of justice. Now, the, the type of solidarity which I, I, I want to, to advance here is that which is in tune with the indigenous African construal or African conception. Of, of solidarity. And here I'm referring to the relational ethics of Ubuntu. In my uh, natal language, Ubuntu can be expressed in another, Ubuntu is a, is a Southern African expression for humanity and uh, for concepts of relational ethics and relational values of solidarity, of care, of support for each other and of community. In my natal language, we may shorten it as bomwul, and which can be translated as for the sake of humanity. So, and here, healthcare is not for profit. It's one of those domains of human endeavors that is completely divorced from profit. Yeah, we know that we need uh, the pharmaceutical companies, they need some profit in order to survive, in order to do carry out research and so on and so forth. But sometimes from observation, this the profit is prioritized over uh, uh, the good of human beings. Like uh, John Beatty, the Kenyan philosopher and theologian, argues, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. This 
the COVID-19 has actually shown us how interdependent and interconnected we are. And it has also shown that those who try to isolate themselves completely are not, in fact, uh, free because in one way or the other, we depend on each other for our survival. Once one person, as the COVID-19 has shown, is infected, there is a high chance that, that the contagion can be spread across a very wide population. Um, according to Tadeusz Metz, uh, solidarity involves promoting others or promoting others' well-being, being sympathetic, acting for the common good and showing concern for others. The traditional African understanding of solidarity encourages harmony, compassion, communion, and identity with others. For instance, um, when there are different versions of solidarity, which consist maybe of kind of reciprocity, consist of uh, giving donations and support for others. But uh, Metz argues that uh, we can make don anonymous donations to charity, for example, um, it, this, which could be a point of solidarity without identity. Because uh, whereas workers and the management in a capitalist firm might well identify with one another, as members of a common group, but hardly exhibit solidarity towards each other. So the indigenous African approach to solidarity, um, what it calls is that it calls for a show of support that is putting ourselves hypothetically in the shoes of others. It doesn't only regard um, those who are receiving our support as others, but as us, we, I am because we are. And since we are, therefore I am. So the us, them divide does not exist in this particular understanding of, of solidarity. Okay. And, and I think this is quite profound because when I when I feel that you feel my pain, you share my pain, and not just giving uh, uh, support for the sake of giving support that, okay, take care, without really seeing you identifying with me, it's, it's, it's more engaging when I show close concern. So a loving, loving uh, or friendly relationship, more or less, is one in which uh, the parties think of themselves as we engage in common activities, act to benefit one another, and do so consequent to sympathy and for, this, and for the other's sake. This is uh, 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 met. So there has been a high, in the, in the, in the context of the COVID-19, in, in, in across Africa, uh, there's been some high degree of solidarity as African countries uh, have taken the lead in the fight. Now, and a very good example is the case of uh, the uh, the case of uh, Madagascar when they were when they produced the uh, the COVID. Uh, I've forgotten the name; it doesn't come to my mind immediately. Uh, the COVID. Uh, drug out of uh, Artemisia, and it was being heralded at one point as very, very much, very successful. It's uh, at, uh, Madagascar was able to share free of charge these uh, products across different parts of Africa. Okay, now in the in Cameroon, we have an example. There is an archbishop who came out with um, uh, a drug produced from uh, local indigenous uh, plants and so on. And it has been shown to be quite effective. And this drug is not sold. It is distributed to those people who show proof, a medical uh, proof of uh, having infected uh, by COVID-19. They are given this medication free of charge. I'm talking about um, the Archbishop of Douala in Cameroon. Douala is the economic capital in Cameroon, and uh, uh, Bishop uh, Cleda. And recently, this uh, medication is being sent or exported to other parts of, 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 of the world. And we have not seen any patient who has come out to say that no he, he took uh, or she took that medication and did not get well some they come back 
you go back and do the test and it's proven. So, but the important thing I want to say here is the typical indigenous African approach and uh, cult cultural attitude towards healthcare, which uh, may be maybe an example, support for the vulnerable, even if we don't have something to give them in terms of medication, but when others feel protected, they feel supported, uh, feel loved, they are much, uh, much likely to regain their health. I mean, we talk about the spiritual dimension of health and things like that. So, in conclusion, I will uh, just like to say that the COVID-19 era has actually uh, brought to light in the notion of vulnerability, which is not only a notion that should be handled within the domain of, uh, of research ethics, it should also be taken seriously in the domain of bedside ethics, in the domain of healthcare ethics and things like that. Vulnerability and fragility calls are typically uh, values, sorry, concepts that calls on the protection by other members, protection of the vulnerable by other members of the community. Because by our very nature, we are interconnected and interdependent beings. What makes a flourishing society is the ability, is the care, the caregiving that we, 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 we give others, the caregiving and support that we give especially the most dependent and uh, the most vulnerable members of our community. Those who have support, the kind of moral support, psychological support, are most likely to recover or bear less burden of the, uh, less of the negative burdens of the pandemic. So, solidarity, show of love, concern, protection is, in our view, the way forward. Thank you very much, Lucia. I hope I did not go far beyond time. Thank you, Jerome. I leave the floor in this case to Carlo, and thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Lucia, for the invitation. I had prepared a short talk about uh, how the concept of uh, vulnerability showed up in philosophical anthropology, but uh, listening to the contributions, uh, maybe it's better if I simply interact with the speakers to ask them uh, to come back to some specific points of their talks, uh, which seem to me particularly, particularly interesting. I will start with uh, Tabitha's, Tabitha's talk. And uh, I must admit that uh, I have always had some problems in defining the category of uh, spirituality, because it seems to me not a very autonomous category. Uh, it is uh, understandable only if we start from a religious vision of the world, and I think that it depends on this uh, vision for its definition. Uh, of course, it's a broader category than religion, but it's also more ambiguous because uh, it seems to try to bring back to religions also, also visions of the world in which uh, perhaps there are holistic feelings, uh, or feelings of connection with nature or with uh, the community or uh, a strong sense of belonging to a cultural tradition. It's uh, in, the, in this uh, existential uncertainty that is ours, uh, of our secularized societies, uh, spirituality risks to be the confused echo of religion after the death of God. And anyway, in your, in your presentation, I have found the elements of uh, uh, greater solidity. First of all, the category of meaning and sense uh, and meaning that's another not maybe not well established category in philosophy, but I think it's a very fruitful and promising one. Uh, even more because in your words, uh, you, you spoke not only of meaning, but uh, of meaning conferral and of the process of giving a sense to one's existence and through social recognition, through empathy and giving meaning to life. Uh, it's an activity that can be practiced at any age and as you have uh, well said, in any condition of health, uh, even of mental health. And in this regard, I have um, 
a question for you if we understand spirituality in this sense uh, in this uh, uh, way as a sense conferring as a process of construction where can we find viable forms of secular spirituality what would you which uh, activities would you um, propose to patients uh, who maybe lack the sense of transcendence but we may be receptive to other proposals of meaning constructions. So you have already uh, given some hints in this direction, but uh, I ask you if you could uh, say us uh, something more. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, I understand this uh, sort of confusion around spirituality and uh, um, everybody here knows that it, it, it is and it remains a very uh, not very well delimited uh, category. And um, John Swinton, I think he was there before, but John Swinton uh, is one of the people who says that we don't need to define uh, spirituality to, to, know, to know what it is. Like you don't, know, you don't have to be able to define uh, philosophically what friendship is to be able to live friendship. And the same goes for love, the same, and, and the same goes for, for other... Um, concepts that we clearly understand, though we cannot define them. So let us just stay with this sort of um, uncomfortable, I agree, with this sort of uncomfortable concept of spirituality, which I do think has consistence. Um, it, it does, um, I think that human beings are more than uh, bio, ecological, uh, biological, psychological and social beings. There is more to life than that. And this more to life than these uh, these categories that I just named, shall we call that spirituality? Now, uh, you've talked about transcendence and, and uh, transcendence does not necessarily uh, relate to religiousness. I know that spirituality mostly comes up in religious contexts, that's where its origins are, but then everything can go back to religion. I mean, uh, healing was a religious occupation long ago it's not that anymore but um uh so so saying that religion comes spirituality comes from religion yes so does nearly everything astronomy comes from comes from uh, religion too so let's let's take spirituality apart from from uh, religiosity from from the religiousness and and look at what does this transcendence relate to other things than god um, there is a theologian, Harry Kuhnemann, who speaks about horizontal transcendence. And then I'm, this is going to answer your question. <laughs> um, he says that um, there is this transcendence that relates to God. So then, then we're nearly always in, in religious context. But there is also something that is bigger than us but, and relates to all of us. Solidarity, for example. And I think Jerome was going to talk about that uh, before he got cut off. But solidarity is a place where um, we can find uh, meaning in life and, and a, sort of, so, a certain form of, of spirituality uh, not necessarily related to religious uh, uh, activities. But, um, of course, art is, is a very powerful uh, meaning of, uh, way of, of finding sense or meaning in, in someone's existence. But music is, is also one of them. Um, I think that um, it's very, very uh, confronting to see uh, people with dementia uh, relating to animals and calming down, feeling at ease, uh, settling themselves when an animal is present. So um, if you want strictly non-religious ways of relating to something that is bigger than us, not strictly biological, not simply psychological, but still part of us, so I call it spiritual, I think that art, music, poetry, uh, animals, um, being together, uh, walking in nature, uh, all these uh, things that we do and that live around us, all these realities are uh, a way of giving meaning to, to one's life. Uh, being in touch with somebody, just hugging, can confer uh, meaning and is sense giving mm -hmm. for um, people with dementia and other people, but um, people of dementia are the people that I focus on. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, it is uh, 
uh, interesting because your position uh, recalls me the position of Susanne Langer. It's an American philosopher, a woman philosopher, who was very interested in this possibility of, uh, of seeing uh, human beings as, as symbolic beings without believing in herself in transcendence. And he, uh, she, uh, at the end, uh, went to the same solutions in art, music, uh, and uh, even culture in a broad sense uh, as ways to to find a way to give meaning to existence <coughs> sorry even in a secularized society and it's um, very very that's, interesting. Uh, she, it, it, indeed that, that's exactly what i'm pointing at now i myself i'm a catholic theologian so um i see in this possibility of horizontal transcendence the presence of God. I'm very Ignatian in, in the way I look at the world, so I see God everywhere. Uh, but I can understand that in this highly secularized uh, Western society in which we live, uh, some people do not want to relate to this vertical transcendence and, and remain at this uh, horizontal level. And it's, it's not a matter of value. It's not a matter of saying, of judging uh, people that do not want or cannot relate to uh, something vertical, but as a Catholic theologian, as a believer, um, I see in this possibility of, of horizontal transcendence something that comes from elsewhere, which I call God. Thank you. Um, I, it would be interesting, it's just really a pity that uh, Jérôme isn't, isn't connecting, but um, uh, I would have liked to talk about vulnerability, which is one of my focus, uh, one of my issues as well in, in my research. And I, and, I, and I quite don't agree with everything that Jérôme, well, I do agree with what he says, but I find that there is a, an aspect in, of vulnerability that is lacking in what he has presented us. He's, for the moment, and he, he's into we, a We miss the part, actually, I think. He is? That we were missing a part of the story. Yeah, so it's... Um, it's, um, it's uh, I think vulnerability is not only... Feel, feel free. Michele has a question in case... So if Carlo, can can we open the, the discussion? And in this case... Comes back, then I, I can... Uh, I imagine you have the part of the discussion dedicated to his uh, presentation. So. Uh, Talita, do you wish to, to go on on vulnerability or...? Um... Well, if, if, if we're sure that um, um, Jerome is coming back, then I'd rather have him with that us. That would be better, I think, also to dialogue with him. So I think yeah. we can... Michele, please, Michele Nicoletti joined us. Thank you for coming. And uh, <laughs> now I, I give you the... Please, Michele. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was just... Uh enjoying your discussion about spirituality and, and I thought that uh, I would have liked to jump in the discussion uh, waiting for uh, Jerome coming back. Uh, uh, no, I, 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 um, I love this kind of discussion about the autonomy of spirituality, which reminds me a lot about the discussion at the beginning of the 20th century uh, on uh, psychology and uh, the empirical foundation of a psychology and there was a discussion typical of the German war about the difference uh, uh, between uh, between uh, the psychological dimension and the spiritual dimension that is the Geist and uh, uh, and I think that it is uh, uh, our problem to distinguish spirituality from religion uh, this is typical of our secular society uh, in which we, we have to uh, legitimate, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the citizenship of this uh, dimension, uh, even for people who do not have any kind of uh, uh, religious dimension and so on. But from a philosophical point of view, uh, it is clear that spirituality is, uh, is a clear autonomous dimension, if it is a dimension, uh, which has to do with the uh, religion, but not necessarily. Um, and and I, I, uh, in, in, which, in what you said, uh, Talita, I appreciate uh, the reference uh, to uh, art, uh, which also Carlo made, 
because I think that this uh, is uh, a very good example of uh, an autonomous dimension of, uh, of the human being in this, sense, uh, in this sense of a spiritual dimension from the intellectual dimension. Uh, uh, the other example that you made, I'm not sure I've got it, but uh, if I got it, uh, I find it more problematic. When uh, you said, uh, for example, in the case of a hug, uh, uh, you can feel the spiritual dimension of, of, uh, of somebody else. On one side, yes, it is true, but this can be even a very uh, um, animal dimension, because even, even when I give a caress to my dog or my cat, I can have a feedback from that, from that being. And, and I'm not sure, maybe yes, but I'm not sure that this means that, that there is a spirituality also of animals, but I, I, I'm not an expert in the field. In, in, this, in, 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 the, in, the, in the case of the, of the art dimension, I find that this is a very good example because your problem, uh, I think, uh, in, in the medical care is that you have to justify uh, I mean, the investment of society uh, with patients with dementia uh, who have not uh, uh, an intellectual dimension but uh, and you and you and you and you make of course an advocacy saying that uh, okay they, they have some components of their rationality which which are not uh, functioning as far as we know as our uh, as our mechanism are functioning but they have another dimension this is which is typically human which is spirituality and uh, we have to care of them because of this dimension but probably you have to give some evidence uh, uh, for, <laughs> to your, <laughs> I mean, to, to your interlocutors. Uh, if, if you need some investment in terms of, of social or medical care. And, and, and so my, my question is, what kind of arguments you are using to justify the, the, the usage of the employment of some resources, human resources, uh, to take care of these people, even if they are in a situation of dementia. And, and can this artistic dimension can offer us any possible path uh, in, the, in the conversation with them or just to... Uh, have you any, any example of people with dementia who are able to... to um, to do something in the field of arts and so on. So sorry for being long, but I hope I, I was, um, my question was clear. Pro productivity remains very important, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and if people with dementia can't be productive, be it in art, then maybe they don't have the right to exist, uh, which is something that some people like uh, Mary Warnock or, or, or Peter Singer would advocate for. Um, well, I'm not sure. I think that there's uh, probably millions of human beings, uh, people with intellectual, profound intellectual disabilities uh, or, or people with in advanced stages of dementia who are um, not able anymore to do anything productive. Um, the only thing they can do is to be there and, and uh, that is about it. So if you want something efficient or and productive, my answer is, I don't think there is. Now, is it because these people, I'm really talking in the ones that are in, in really advanced stages, uh, people that are profoundly uh, dis intellectually disabled are maybe in the same case. I'm not talking about people being unconscious because I'm not at all specialized in unconsciousness and I think that is still something different. But from the moment somebody is able to open their eyes or uh, be aware of somebody else's presence, these people are there and these people relate. And I can tell you that until the very, very, very last second of their life, they want to relate. So when we, and I think that until the very last second of their life, 
their spiritual dimension remains attainable. They remain persons. They don't become vegetables. They don't become empty shells, right? They remain people. They remain. They remain their personhood and they remain persons in relation with a desire to relate. They're not only people with needs. So um, I, I don't want to follow up on the question is, is can art, can people with dementia do uh, magnificent things in art? They can. And um, uh, Veronique Lefebvre in what? In, in Paris uh, has done, it's absolutely stunning, uh, an art project with people with dementia in uh, moderate and advanced stages. Uh, they've been taken to uh, the Rodin Museum and they did, I think on a four week uh, basis, they did uh, workshops of uh, modeling and, and artwork. And what they have created is stunning. I can't say it any other way. But it's not because these people are able to create stunning uh, uh, artwork that they are valuable. If they could not, they would still be valuable because they are human beings and they are able to relate and they are wanting to relate. They are not only empty uh, entities in need or, or uh, in need of other people. They, they still exist on themselves, um, even without their intellectual uh, luggage. They are, they are still, and that is where this spirituality comes in, because there's nothing else left at a certain moment. Um, so, um, yes, art can be a way for these people to express themselves, express things that they may not have been able to express before. Um, Veronique Lefebvre in what uh, tells us that one, one gentleman apparently was really very uh, clumsy, not artisty at all, and he's made these beautiful artworks in, in these workshops. So something was liberated there. So it's not impossible, but I don't think we can make this capacity of this one person now a condition to make uh, artwork accessible to people with uh, 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 dementia. Um, um, you see, it's like in my, my students often ask, but what is the what is the plus of spiritual care? We have psychological care. Why do we need spiritual care too? But up to me, the two are really very different, and that is um, that is where you, what, what you said at this discussion in the, in the first uh, in the first half of the, of, of the 20th century uh, also turns around this. Um, I think that psychological psychological care is for people who have a problem and who are sick. So it's a therapy. Um, I wouldn't speak of spiritual therapies. We speak about spiritual care, and it's. It's just something that is essential for us. It's like food. Food is something that you do not, some food can cure you, but you don't eat food to be cured. You eat food because you enjoy it, because it's nice, because we, we can do it together and, uh, um, and we can relate and, and eating on your own is okay, but eating together is always better. And with spirituality, it's much like food. We don't go in, to spiritual care to cure people. Uh, spiritual care is there to, to to be together, to relate, to to look for a sense of meaning um, if if that comes up, but not necessarily. And so I think, but probably Carlo can say more about it. But um, why would hugging a cat not sort of enter in 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 in, in the discussion of of spiritual care? Um, Probably, and this would, Jerome would have things to say on that, but um, spirituality, African spirituality, extends largely beyond the human, uh, the human reality as, as we know it here in Europe. So um, I think that... I can jump in. Yeah, please do. Uh, the relationship with animals can give a strong sense of connections with connection with nature, and this can give sense to one's existence. I don't need the existence. I don't need the. I don't have the need to call that spirituality because for me the category of giving sense to one's existence is uh, uh, largely autonomous from uh, the other one we use from the category of. Uh, I, I think that in this case, uh, a philosopher uh, like Kassirer would be useful. Uh, uh, 
humans are uh, symbolic animals. Mm -hmm. They find they find the symbolic dimension everywhere, but they make it themselves. Uh, and even even in the contact with nature, this is very important. Even also in order to avoiding uh, biologism or to reduce uh, our ex our experience only to a biological dimension. That's not the point. Sure, it is not the point. But I think that uh, the yes, the relationship with animals is very important because it gives us the sense of being in the world with with uh, with other subjects that are other than us. <laughs> this is my point <laughs> regarding animals. <laughs> well, somebody like Franz de Baal um, sort of advocates for uh, chimpanzee spirituality. Uh, I'm I'm not a specialist, but he doesn't limit. Uh, spirituality to something purely human, which is in, in theology is often considered as such. It is the spirit, the spiritual is where humans are utterly human. Uh, but this is where we are attacked on that issue from, from everywhere. And, and we might have to give in that uh, orangutans and, and, and the higher, what we call the higher species, um, might be uh, in some way spiritual. I don't know what you think. Sure. M many faculties that in the past were monopoly of the human of human beings yeah. are now uh, ascribed even to primates. For instance, the capacity of deception or the capacity of uh, empathy in a, in a higher degree. I, I don't remember if the Val speaks explicitly about spirituality, but I should check. <laughs> I, should I check. think he did. It's something which we uh, <laughs> Chimpanzees running around with a stick in the rain or something. I, I can't remember, but please check. <laughs> but I think if I can intervene as well, I think uh, in the Middle Age philosophy, there was this question about uh, could, do animals have a soul? And that's the spiritual dimension of animals for the language of, 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 of these uh, of these. Uh, period of time that was the idea the soul was representing like to say the, the spiritual component uh, and it was very strong the case and I am thinking about the Jewish thought and Jewish religion where this idea of a soul in animals is uh, it remains uh, quite central I think into the debate so there is a form of recognition or also in other religions where the the sanctity of life is uh, attributed to animals uh, in the Hinduism, for example. So there are examples of uh, <coughs> uh, religious and spiritual thought uh, which recognize uh, a form of spirituality or attribute forms of spirituality to animals too. But uh, I have something, if I can intervene with a little question now, and uh, I try to, to search for Jerome. I hope he can join us. Uh, uh, briefly, shortly. But, uh, so my question is more about um, a passage that Talita mentioned and uh, this idea that there is a wish or, and a need to relate, to enter in relationship or there is a desire. And uh, so past week in Turin there was the uh, Turin, Turin Spirituality Festival and uh, the theme, the topic of this year was the desire. So spirituality as a form of desire. I think uh, also starting from the definition that uh, Dominique Jacquemin offers about the spirituality, this idea of a movement of existence or an existential movement. I am wondering if we cannot consider that the spirituality is a form, like to say, of desire, of deep desire, that can be something that requires a form of relationship. So it's a desire of something else or a desire of ourselves, but I mean something that forces us or force a person to enter in a relationship. That means to create uh, or, or simply to, to express herself uh, also in terms of a wish that is more an existential wish, something that is related to, to the life itself. So I, I, I wonder if in, in, in patients with serious cognitive uh, impairment and disabilities, do you think there is still this form of, uh, 
of yeah. desire and of uh, wish that can be something also strongly motivating or strongly um, keeping the, their identity? Um, I, I, thank you, uh, Lucia. It's a beautiful question. And actually, it, um, it, it relates to uh, something that the French philosopher Corinne Peluchon uh, puts to the fore. Um, she she de defines autonomy. Now, um, I'm taking autonomy because it's such an important principle in, in what we consider personhood. And um, she said, for her, autonomy is not about being in, in self-control or, or being independent. She says, uh, autonomy is this double capacity of being capable of desire, being capable of having values, not just needs, but desires, which is active, and on the other hand, uh, the capacity to translate these desires into actions. And it's interesting to have this double capacity and to define autonomy in having desires and being able to uh, fulfill these desires. Very often when people um, have uh, cognitive challenges, um, they can't fulfill anymore, this sec they can't work with this second capacity. They're not capable anymore of uh, fulfilling their desires. They need substantial support to fulfill these desires. But the first part of autonomy always remains. They remain also persons of desire. And John Tronto, she didn't formulate it like that, but it is very important for Jane Tronto too, John Tronto too, as we're talking about care with, with Jerome, uh, to, to respect and, and to look for what does the person want. It's very often difficult to interpret what a person exactly wants. And this also changes over time, which is very confusing for relatives when, when um, somebody's father was always very fond of cheese. And then, it, I'm in France, right? So here fathers are fond of cheese. Uh, and then when they, um, when they get older, when they get dementia, and suddenly they're, they don't like cheese anymore, they only want sweet things. So it's very, sometimes difficult to um, not impose your desires on, on the person, but um, this respect of autonomy in, the, in, in uh, what am I going to say? Sorry, this, this <laughs> respect, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the respect of someone's desire um, is very important if you want also to respect their autonomy, even if for the, for the second part, um, this person will always need substantial support to fulfill the desire. Now, I haven't heard of, um, what, what, what did you say, spirituality as a form of desire, but I find it very beautiful uh, because it, it puts at the core, well, the desire, you can't desire on your own, like right? desire is always for something else. Yes, there is an intention. So, so exactly. it's, 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 yeah, and, and, it, and it marks a sort of openness to, to the world. And, and I think through this openness, this brings us back to vulnerability too, but um, this, this openness is, is where uh, what we have to look out for in persons with dementia. Uh, they're not closed entities on their cells. They're not empty shells or vegetables. Mm -hmm. They are um, still people of desire. And, and yeah, well, why not formulate spirituality as a, as a form of desire? I haven't thought about it before, so it would be, would be difficult for me now to have something very intelligent to say on the subject. But uh, I, I'd like to, to dig into this and, and see how we can formulate that uh, better. So I, I look up uh, what they said in Torino. Okay. I, I, and there is another point, if I can still go on. It, it's related about uh, the, to the relevance of the body that you underscore, like to say the presence, uh, the bodily presence of patients, which can be also um, apparently not present uh, intellectually or cognitively. But I think I, I, I feel or I, I have the impression there is a, a contribution of phenomenology in philosophical terms that can be very relevant also in thinking about the body and the bodily presence and the body as a 
as a way to to interact with the world I like to see but it is our presence into the world so it, it's a way interact with the body uh, of a person who is also severely ill and, and cognitively um, uh, disabled could be a way to to keep like to say the sense of uh, the, the presence of others there is something th that goes through the body in terms also of understanding comprehensions and uh, and possibility to feel the reality around yeah um, um this is very very important because it's something that relatives and friends and you hear it everywhere and the, his body is still there but but the person is gone this is some sort of idea that is very often uh, vocated when when uh, people talk about persons who have alzheimer's and uh, as you say I, I think this is really um a very negative way of considering the person because the, the person is still there the body is still there, but it's always more than the body. And if Dominique Jacquemin is correct to see the body as a possible gateway to a person's spiritual dimension, but maybe also to to, to what this person is, then then um, interacting with the body is more than interacting with... I mean, I'm interacting with a glass, but it's not when I'm interacting with a person's Body, I'm interacting with a person. There's always a person there, and it's not just the person inside. The body and the person are one, right? Um, the person re remains his identity. That's another point that people are. Uh, he, he's lost his identity. I think identities change over time, but you cannot lose your identity. You, you change your role, change parts of how you are considered change, but you are you. Um, and, and it's dangerous, this, this discourse that we have around people with dementia, that um, uh, it's, it's always a, a disease of lose, losing. It's a loser's disease. People lose their identity, lose their personhood, they lose their capacities, they lose their desires. And it's just not true. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of pr presence uh, alongside uh, people with dementia. And it can be extremely frustrating because our society is here. But I've read that in Africa it's not any better. Um, we we leave these, we drop these people, right? Well, once dementia sit, sets in, most of the time people get uh, uh, isolated. And, and of course, if you're all alone with a person who has dementia, um, it's very, very, very hard to keep on seeing that the person is still there. You need other people to be there to support you, to support the person with dementia. But um, if we d can't change the way we look upon this disease and we look upon people with dementia, um, I think we're, yeah, we're missing out on something uh, crucial. Uh, we're missing out on, on something very human about us. And, and uh, we're going ahead in this idea that one has to be, if you're not productive and if you can't, uh, have some intelligent discourse, then you're not worth being called uh, a person, which I think is extremely uh, sad, actually. Is that, do I answer your question? Um, yes, I, thank I, I, you I, I a lot. Uh, no, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank um, you answered uh, perfectly. I, if I can say something, considering I fear Jerome would not... Uh, I don't know if he will be back, but uh, the um, the idea the idea Jerome wanted to present in, um, related to the concept of autonomy is that in the African culture, uh, the uh, autonomy is intended in, in relational terms. That is something uh, uh, that uh, became uh, a new approach to the notion of autonomy, also in the bioethical debate. This idea that. Uh, autonomy couldn't be completely understood just in an individualistic way or as a self-determination, uh, uh, but it should be uh, in, understood also as, a, as something that reflects our moral orientation, moral attitude, that it's closely related to relationship we live in, communities we live in, and so there was this idea, I think, that uh, there is always, 
in, in order to consider the moral disposition, moral orientation or moral autonomy, you need to, to relate uh, with the community, with the we and not just uh, with the I, so, uh, with the plural dimension. And, uh, and, and Jerome wanted also to underscore the relevance of this uh, conception. Uh, to um, to the concept of solidarity, because from the idea that uh, there is a communitarian dimension and there is this uh, uh, vulnerability that is a human trait, uh, there is also an appeal to solidarity that is a stronger appeal and maybe it's uh, stronger uh, at present. It has been it has become very, uh, stronger also considering the uh, the global emergency. Uh, we are dealing with uh, so. If I yeah. can, I Sorry, think yes. There could have been a link between the talks of our of our speakers because the the idea of this uh, interrelational character of personal identity can be put in connection with your idea that uh, we don't need a high level of cognitive uh, performance uh, to be linked with other and to give sense to our existence because normally in the western thought the idea of autonomy is linked with the idea of a high performance in intellectual uh, abilities and i don't know but then maybe we can ask himself <laughs> this time because jerome you are back he's back we have more minutes we, we can one has uh, remarks to do or I think uh, okay because there, there were observations and we were awaiting actually for your conclusion it was not possible to uh, to to go to to finish without because you gave us uh, like uh, I think a, a very relevant uh, picture also of what does it mean to to consider different uh, ways to interpret uh, notions that are relevant into the debate as uh, autonomy, vulnerability, solidarity. But most of all, I think you helped us to to see what does it mean to look also at, at an emergency or a, at an outbreak from a global perspective where the, the meaning also of justice and equity changes. Mm. Okay. We, uh, it, it, Jerome will be back, I know. <laughs> I am not, okay. Okay, so I told Jerome, we, we needed your intervention because it uh, okay thank you so i think if the others wish to say something i talked enough i just wanted to to say that i agree with Jerome that uh, the covid experience can increase uh, our awareness that we are uh, interdependent the problem will be in future to see if this awareness will be limited only to sanitary questions uh, because there, I think uh, everyone in the world agree uh, we, we have to find common ways to fight uh, viruses. But the point is, if this awareness can be expanded, extended to other issues, uh, uh, for instance, migrants uh, or uh, economic politics, and this will be a great challenge, I think. But I fully agree that the, maybe the COVID. Uh, a pandemic is one of the rare events in the history of mankind that can increase our awareness uh, even in everyday life that we are interconnected. Yes, I think actually in the, in the first episode uh, we, we, um, we heard of this concept of One Health that is a concept that has been developed in uh, uh, in medicine and in biology to talk about this interconnectedness of the different species uh, uh, living on the planet. That means the human species, but the uh, animals uh, and uh, plants. And so there is this idea that there is a deep connection also with the environment and that our the human condition cannot be 
thought and preserved also if we don't consider the whole system which is uh, involved and i think uh, it is that the interconnectedness is not anymore i we can say a philosophical concept or just an ecological concept is something that we need to to think uh, theoretical but also at the same time in practical terms okay please tell it down. um I, I of course i'm very much impressed with uh Jérôme's presentation um uh, I, I would like to add something on, on uh, your interpretation of, or your comprehension, Jean, of, of vulnerability, um, which is maybe it's, it's the mainstream uh, comprehension of vulnerability. When I ask people in, in an audience what is vulnerability, they will always, in, at least in France, say uh, vulnerability is disease, weakness, uh, disability and death. Those are the four things that people associate with uh, vulnerability and I have um, I think that is true uh, but it's only part of the story uh, for me and there are other researchers that uh, feel it in the same way vulnerability is our ontological openness to others so it is of course an openness so an exposure to harm which is what you have highlighted uh, which is very very real uh, aspect of vulnerability but this, it is this, the same openness that we that exposes us to harm is the openness that allows us to love and to be loved. And I don't know why the creator has uh, given this one aspect, this vulnerability, the, the possibility of being open to harm and being open to love. But I think that we have to articulate both of them. Um, if we only... Um, if we only focus on the negative side of vulnerability as a sort of sword of Damocles that is above our heads and, and something that we absolutely have to overcome, I think we ignore an essential and an ontological part of uh, who we are. Um, I, I believe that vulnerability is, is really essential and needed if we want to be uh, as human as possible. So I, I just wanted to, to to put this into the conversation. I know Rieke uh, said that vulnerability is sort of opposed to agency. Um, for, for him, vulnerability is appeals, responsibility, calls, sorry, calls for responsibility and, and is opposed to autonomy. I, I think there is more to it. I think it's only part of the story. Now he's gone again. <laughs> okay. We... we... I hope, okay. Now I think uh, I'm waiting for Jerome because I am sure he will arrive <laughs> in a couple of seconds. I, I really thank all of you for joining us, for accepting the invitation, for remaining here uh, for this uh, confrontation and this dialogue. I think it, it was very nice for me, very beautiful and, and extremely interesting also to listen to the remarks and contribution all of you brought to the discussion. Uh, I thank also Jerome at this point because he is coming and going, but okay, we, we will call him after to, to tell him thank you. And uh, I hope to see you soon and I wish you all the best uh, for your work also during this uh, uh, peculiar and extraordinary period of, uh, of our history. Yeah, okay. and thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Lucia, and um, I hope we'll, we'll see in better circumstances, but um, maybe we, may we meet again. Exactly. Thank you, Talita. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Jero. Okay. See you soon. Bye -bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.